to the backbone of Britain, across the Pennines, the Peak District, and across into the Welsh mountains, before finally coming to rest around the city of Westminster below Big Ben. But it all started out on a very, very wet day in the city of Edinburgh in Scotland. And the long trek south began as the riders moved off to face 117 miles across the moors to Newcastle-upon-Tyne. Paul Sherwin, my co-commentator on the Tour de France, is back in more familiar garb. The roads to the borders are stark and beautiful, but challenging to say the least to the riders. On the steep ascent of Carter Bar, the pack held together. The attraction of £24,000 in prize money was of little concern yet, with stages longer than those in the Tour de France. On Battle Hill, as the roads began to dry out, there was a general flexing of the muscles, and at the summit, it was the Spanish rider Arenas who just pips Chris Lillywhite and Dave Rayner. Then, with only 27 miles left, Swiss champion Jörg Müller, free of his duties to Pedro Delgado, his teammate in the Tour de France, made his escape. And with him for company went Philippe Casado from France in the white and happy-go-lucky Aussie Alan Piper. The big Australian doesn't get too many chances to win races. He's normally what the French call a domestique. So when he arrived in Newcastle with the two other riders, the whole bunch were right behind him, and Piper was still full of fight. Muller led through past an enormous crowd in the city centre. Piper was second, Casado was in third place. But a lap later, the other two had been caught, and Piper was on his own. Alan Piper has done the ride of his life today because he hasn't won a race all year, and now he's done the ride undoubtedly of the year as far as he's concerned because it should have been all over. The race was right on him. They picked up Muller, they picked up Casado, and they were right alongside Alan Piper. Piper decided that was the time to go, and he's only got the climb of Grey Street now. Surely he's got the psychological advantage. Again, the gears changing in the identical point as it was the previous lap. This time he affords a look over his right shoulder. Grits his teeth now, swing his bike from side to side. This is it. Alan Piper is going to enjoy a first victory of the season. And I might be wrong, but I think the last time he won a race was in the centre of Birmingham in the Kellogg series a year ago. So it's a grand return for Alan Piper. And believe me, there's no more popular winner for the people here because he's done the ride of his life. A brilliant ride by Piper, and it looks to me now as though he's earned himself the whole length of Grey Street. Because Alan Piper comes home with kisses to the crowd, and what a picture that is. Alan Piper home and dry. It was a marvellous victory for Alan Piper. The Belgian Paul Hagedor in the second, and John Wainwright was third. Now, part of Piper's prize was a chance to ring home and tell the family. <laughs> well, Piper had a job telling people what he'd done, but the next day was going to be a different story. It was the longest stage in British cycling, 170.6 miles from Newcastle upon Tyne, right across the North Yorkshire Moors and across down to Manchester. The race began to stretch out on the very first climb, coming out of the Richmond Dales, and Stephen Rooks, the Dutchman, put the pressure on. Alan Piper in yellow was about six down the line and seemed to be in trouble. At this stage of the race, everybody thought that Rooks was going for the special prize on top of the climb, but they were wrong. He just kept on pedalling. And gradually, his lead built up, while the rest behind just enjoyed the countryside. The gap grew to 1 minute 40 seconds before Sid Barris, the man from Yorkshire, tried to catch up. Barris has lived and trained over the Yorkshire moors all of his life, but even he had never seen crowds like those waiting on top of Fleet's Moss. Well, how about this for atmosphere on a small and top? We go up uh, over Greeks Moss, over Fleet Moss, I'm sorry, as we come up towards the summit here. And this now beginning to hurt Stephen Rocks. And over the top he goes, and that is the second major climb of today's stage in the back to Stephen Rooks, so he must now be considered a major contender for the King of the Mountains title. He takes 12 points over each climb. Barris is yet to come over. This is Rooks again now. He'll shortly uh, run off this plateau and begin the long descent down towards the valleys through Buckton, Starbottom, into Kettlewell, and on through Threshfield and Skipton, and, of course, Lancashire lies ahead. 
Emilio Yorks is stone here, keeping in on the right road. And this is Sid Barris now in the corridor of people. Have you seen a crowd like this for a bicycle race in Britain before? All the cheers for Sid Barris. The pats on the back are coming. 5,000 people have waited here for hours to see this today. And they're just parting as Barris gets to them. He's going to go over the top in second place, and that's a marvellous ride for the 39-year-old. There he is, over the line. Second place for Sid Barris. And the race already splintering behind, too, as the chase comes for the points. But Barris was caught near Kettlewell, and then the dangers of riding in the big pack were highlighted. Malcolm Elliott in the centre was the main contender who had fallen. Far off days now, finishing up Bordeaux, third on the stage in the Tour de France. While up ahead, unaware of all these problems, was Stephen Rooks. But there was now a group chasing him. His lead, which was up to six minutes at one point, was coming back. Phil Thomas, near as the camera, was working well. So too at the back there was Joey McLaughlin. They worked well for a long, long way. And finally, at the beginning of the climb of Blackstone Edge, Rooks was picked up after over 60 miles alone in the lead. He looked over his shoulder to see who was coming up to him. The long, steep slopes of Blackstone Edge were again lined with hundreds of people, and Phil Thomas was to lose contact with the leaders here, leaving Sergio Fenazzi, Joey McLaughlin, Stephen Rooks, Philippe Chevalet and Denny Roux to fight out the finish in Manchester. These are the five that have made this race now. For my money, surely from these five, the winner will come in Westminster, or Westminster on Sunday, rather. Stephen Rooks, the hero of the day, the man of the match, as we should say. And at the bell now, just one mile to the finish, Philippe Chevalier in that uh, multicoloured jersey of Toshiba. Joey McLaughlin never far away in second place. I think he's fought to keep that second place almost since we left the top of the Lancashire Moors. This massive crowd loving every minute of this entertainment here. And it really has been a marvellously successful race since we left Edinburgh. Back with Phil Thomas. He's uh, clear of Paul Kimmage, but he will only finish in sixth place because ahead of him are those five leaders. He must be wishing now he'd been that little bit fitter. Now we're coming up towards the sprint here. We've got uh, Denny Rue, who's taking to McLaughlin, who refuses to relinquish second place. McLaughlin's anxious now to see the finish, though. He looks over his shoulder to see what he's got. McLaughlin heads up towards the line now. He's checking if he's got the effort. Look at the face of McLaughlin now as he leads them into Albert Square now. The finish line is in view. Joey McLaughlin is going to win this for sure. Well, that will give him the 10 seconds. Now, where will Stephen Rooks finish? Because that will decide the yellow jersey as Joey McLaughlin comes clear. For Nazis fuming, the young new professional in second place. And Rooks is across in fourth place. And by my reckoning, that will make them both equal on time. And if it does, it'll go to the point to decide the yellow jersey. That's exactly what happened in this unbelievable situation. At the end of two days, the yellow jersey is on the shoulders of Stephen Rooks. But what a great performance it was by Joey McLaughlin. It was, yeah. This is the day I wait for, and uh, haven't he went to plan? I'm afraid I haven't got the jersey, but there's still another two days to go, so <laughs> let's see what happens. Hasn't been the best of seasons for you. We said after 86 when you won the milk race that uh, great things were expected of you. Injuries this season have put you back a bit. Have yeah. you turned the corner? Well, I've got over the injuries, and I had like two months off, so I've only been on the bike one month. And as you say, the season hasn't been really uh, good to me, but... Things are looking up now. And indeed they were. But if only Joey McLaughlin could have sprinted one second further ahead, because then he would have had the leader's yellow jersey. As it was, the lead stayed with Stephen Rooks. But McLaughlin was equal on time, Rooks getting the lead because he had the better daily stage finish. Sergio Fenazzi was third, but only two seconds back. And the two Frenchmen, Philippe Chevalier and Denis Roux, were fourth and fifth. Roux was also the leader in the King of the Mountains.